Praise the Lord, everybody. Truly, it is a blessing to have another opportunity to share with you God's precious word on today. We truly are thankful to the Lord for all that he has done and all that he continues to do. Tonight, we're going to look at something that the Lord gave me to share with you on tonight. And what we're going to look at is actually called divine detours divine detours anybody know what a detour is has anybody been on a detour and you didn't think that you would ever be on one before you know you just found yourself in a situation where you had not counted on you did not see it coming you did not know that you would find yourself in certain kinds of of circumstances so if we were to pick up with where we have been, we saw that recently we were actually looking at the account of the Apostle Paul. So the Apostle Paul had left Jerusalem and he was on his way. Essentially, he was going to Rome. That was a place that he actually wanted to go and he had been wanting to go to Rome. So God gave him the okay to do it. However, we do know that the storm brewed up. You know, we went through this a couple of Sundays ago, how when they were on their way to Rome, that they actually went through a storm. And that storm was so dangerous that they actually ended up shipwrecked. And when they ended up shipwrecked, the storm again had basically decimated the the ship that they were on and we do know that some of them were given the charge to go on off and jump off you know after they had gotten close to this to this island they had given the charge to jump off and those of you who can't swim i want you to hold on to what you can hold on to which in some cases meant that they had to hold on to pieces of the ship some of them had to hold on to pieces of debris that were basically on the ship so they found themselves really in a very, very dangerous kind of situation, which, again, we do find ourselves on sometimes. So as they were on this particular ship and this ship had basically had basically decimated, they found themselves shipwrecked on an island. And the name of this island is Malta. And we're going to talk more about this in just a little while. But if we were to look back at this term detour, this term detour is one that, again, we are very, very familiar with. In fact, if we were to define it, the word detour literally means a long or roundabout route that is taken to avoid something or to visit somewhere along the way. Now, I know with that being in scope, I believe that all of us can truly see what detours are really about. Has anybody ever been on one before? <laughs> you know, I often look back even at my own life and I often think about the fact that, you know, I thought that I would be in education, you know, or, or along my career line a whole lot earlier. Um, initially, I wanted to go to med school and God saw fit for me to go in a different direction. Um, I didn't really know exactly why. I just know that he caused me to go in a different direction or he gave me other options. And I ended up going in a totally different direction. And I look back at the layout of the way that God allowed things to work out. And I often thank him. I give him the glory because he takes all of us on detours within our lives. All of us go um Sometimes in directions that we don't necessarily count on. And I mentioned this, you know, time and time again, how I actually was not mature enough to be anybody's teacher at 21, 22, 23 years old. Yeah, I was good in chemistry. I understood chemistry. I understood physics. I understood math and my subject matter. You know, that was not a problem. That was my major. But I did not have the character, you know. I believe that I had some potential, but I did not have the character to walk in that position yet. And God knew it. I mean, when we even look back at the life of Joseph, for instance, you know, Joseph went through years and years before he actually got into the position that God wanted him to be. I mean, he went through a lot of ups. He went through a lot of downs. Actually, it seems like it was really more downs than ups. But the whole time God was building his 
his experience base. God was building his character. God was building within him everything that he would need to be able to function in the place that God wanted him to be. So saints and friends, I want you to always bear this in mind. When God takes you through detours, even if we were to look right now, because most of us hate detours, we want to go in the most direct way that we possibly can to get to the place that we want to be. Why? Because we're typically impatient. We want to do things on our own time frame. We want to do things the way that we think that we want to do them. And we really don't want much guidance when it comes to doing things. And we really don't. Uh, look very favorably when God sends us on detours. In fact, there were some people who did not get married at certain points in your life because God had to develop you into who he wanted you to be. Some of us were not, some of us men were not husband material at certain points within our lives. We may have had potential, but potential does not mean that you're walking in the place where you will be walking in later on after you have developed. There are some ladies out there who were not wife material 15, 20 years ago, 5, 10 years ago, but God had to take you through some places that you don't always like. In fact, none of us really like process. We don't like process. And it's not that God is stopping us, so to speak, but in many cases, he takes us through situations. He takes us through this thing that we call life. He takes us through those unexpected situations. Question, how many of us in this room right now have been dealing with those X factors, those things you had not counted on, those things you just found yourself in? You may have found yourself not, not literally shipwrecked, but you may have found yourself on a detour. You may have found yourself in a place longer than you thought that you would actually be. In fact, you might might even find yourself a little frustrated because you feel like, Lord, I haven't been in this thing long enough and I don't think that I need to be in here any longer. Well, guess what? You're not in control of when you want to be wherever you want to be because when you say, Lord, for you, I live, for you, I die, and Lord, I want you to run my life, then that means that you... Turn over the reins of your life to him. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. Because essentially, we are the best. We are masters at making messes out of our lives. I thank God for the detours. Because some of the detours in some of our lives have kept us from being incarcerated. And some of the detours in our lives have caused some of us to be incarcerated because what God actually did was spared your life. Some of us went through detours in which you went through an accident. You may have gone through something that may have slowed you way down because at the rate that you were going, it's a good chance you wouldn't even be alive had God not intervened and had God not taken you on a detour. Many of the detours that we go on are not necessarily in a straight line. Give God the glory when he sends you on detours, when God sends you on detours. Not when you send yourself out of disobedience, but when God sends you on detours, just tell him thank you. Even if it seems like it's taking you way more time than what you had anticipated. God knows the big picture. Just trust him. Just trust him on whatever the issue is. Even if you're getting there a little bit later than what you anticipated, God knew the reason why. God sometimes has to prepare the road so that you'll be able to walk down the road. Sometimes God has to prepare even the job or the position so that you will be able to operate within it. Look here, when we even look at the way that the earth was laid out. Look here. The, the environment that God intended for man to operate in had to be created before he put the man into the environment. Man. On so, day six, before he made Adam, Eden had already existed. So God created the atmosphere or the environment before he put man within it. Understand this. Don't get impatient because there are many times when God could be actually creating the environment that he wants you to operate in, but he has to get the environment ready so that you'll be able to walk into it. But now understand this, while he's creating the environment, while he's making things conducive for you, he's also developing you so that you'll be able to operate within it effectively. None of us wants to make a mess out of our lives. So that's why we have to choose to trust God in whatever area that we that we find ourselves in. And if we're guided by the Lord, we will be on the right path at the right time. 
What is a detour? A detour is oftentimes out of the way, totally out of the way. Question, how many of us have ever been distracted by other things that have also caused us to go on detours? Because sometimes God has to deal with us. Why? Because we get so easily distracted. He has to change our value system. And sometimes you'll find yourself clean out the way, clean out the way. Some of us are still going around certain situations that God could have been brought us through, but simply because I our mindset was not right. Our, we, our thoughts were not right. We were not right for what God actually wanted to take us into. So we need to give God the glory when he takes us on those unexpected detours. When he takes us off the beaded path. Because if you really got everything that you had planned for, some of us would have married the wrong person. Some of us would have taken the wrong job. Some of us would have gone down the wrong road in life. Some of us would be in the wrong city. Some of us would be in the wrong careers. Some of us would not even have given our lives to God because God took some things that were dysfunctional to drive you closer to him. You wouldn't be who you are had you not gone through what you survived. So God allows detours to happen all the time. Many times they're very, very inconvenient. Detours are often inconvenient. So the Bible tells us over in Acts chapter 28, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn in them. In Acts chapter 28, starting from verse 1 down through verse 3, the Bible says, once we were safe on shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. Uh, the King James says Melita, which is also Malta. Now, Malta is really a part of a chain of islands. You know, it's not a super large island at all, but where they actually shipwrecked or where they crashed, they didn't recognize that they were on Malta because they were not around where the port actually is. Because had they seen the port of Valita, had they seen the port, then they would have automatically recognized where they were. But they did not recognize it. Why? Because they were just coming out of a storm. Question. Had you, have you ever just come out of a storm? Have you ever just come out of a really bad situation and you really were trying to make barons? Lord, I'm trying to get my mind around where I am now. You, you know what? Sometimes we even go through stuff where our spouses might ask us or somebody in your life might ask you, you know, how are you doing today? How are you? Are you, are you okay? And you can't hardly even get your mind together because what's normal to you is not normal. Why? Because you've been through so many things that now have you to a place where you don't recognize some place where you probably should be recognizing. So this is kind of what was going on right here on Malta. The Bible says that the people of the island were very kind. They were very, very kind to them. Now understand this. This time frame is... Probably around mid to late November. So in this particular region, it was kind of cold. It was very, very rainy. We know that they had just come out of a very rainy kind of situation. So what the people actually did was they built a fire. Now, it was about 276 of them or so on that on that ship when it shipwrecked and understand it's none of them died because God told them that none of them were actually going to die. So we find that the people of Malta were very, very, very nice, very nice people. They're very nice people. And they built a fire for all of them. So they were very, very hospitable. We find something here about Paul. Now, Paul, God's man here, Shows us, those who may be listening to me right now who are in leadership. He's really doing exactly what Jesus would have done as well. Instead of waiting to be served. Because understand this, Paul at this time is really like a prisoner. He was, you know, he was not free in the way that we would think that he would be. But because he's given great advice, because the favor of God, really, now that's the primary thing. The favor of God is actually up on his life. Because the favor of God is up on his life, and God has him on a divine assignment, even though this is a detour, but God has him on a divine assignment, we see that Paul takes up really the example that everyone in leadership 
really should take up. He finds himself serving. So leaders, look, let me put it like this. Anybody who's in leadership and those who are in leadership right now, I want you to just listen to me very carefully. Strive to be a leader and not a boss. A boss tells folks what to do. A leader shows people what to do. A boss is one who just points his finger at whatever the task is. A leader gets into the situation and shows people what to really do. The disciples needed to know what it meant to serve. They needed to know what it meant to really be in leadership. Jesus says, you want a class on leadership, I'm going to show you what it means to lead. Jesus got down there and started washing bunions, started washing corns. I don't know if these jokers' feet were smelling or not. I don't know. But he showed them real leadership is actually about serving. The Apostle Paul did this. So in other words, to a true leader, no job or duty is too small that they can't find themselves doing. Because a true leader understands that not only is the person in lights that everybody is aspiring to be, not only is that person important, but even the person that is most overlooked is just as important because in God's eyesight, there are no big eyes in little U's. So Paul does this. The Bible says he gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire. So in other words, the, 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 the people had already built a fire. Paul goes and finds himself going and picking up some sticks. Now, nobody else, the Bible doesn't tell us any, anything about anybody else doing this. But we find real leadership doing this. He goes and picks up the sticks. When he picks up the sticks, he doesn't realize that one of the sticks is alive, really. So the Bible says a poisonous snake. I like to use the word venomous here. But a poisonous snake driven out by the heat bit him on the hand. Wow. So <laughs> I I'm just ratchet. I'm just I'm just I'm just grasping my putting my mind around this. He picks up a stick. He picks up these sticks, puts them on a the fire, and we find that while he's putting them on the fire, that this serpent, this snake, this viper, venomous viper. Now some historians say that on Malta right now, that they actually don't even have venomous <laughs> snakes upon it. I've never been to Malta. I just read a lot. But they say they actually don't even have venomous serpents on Malta right now because they've actually uh, been eradicated off of the island. I don't know if that's the case or not. But we do know at that particular time, they had a snake problem. They had a serious snake problem. So Paul shakes this thing off. And he shakes it into the fire. Now, this is something that the Lord laid in my heart to share with you on tonight. Being under attack does not mean that you are not in the will of God. I'm going to say that once again. And I want you to share this video out with somebody. Being under attack does not mean that you are not in the will of God. That's a double. Those are two knots in there together. So, in other words, you can really expect to be under attack when you are in the will of God. Some people and somebody who's listening to me right now, you may be frozen by fear because you are afraid of what people are going to say. You're afraid of the controversy. You're afraid of how some people are going to throw you under the bus when you move in the direction that God wants you to move. Look here. If God wants you to move in the direction, if God wants you to cut somebody loose, if God wants you to pursue something that you are afraid to pursue, but God says now it's time because you actually do have the skill set. I have equipped you. I've given you everything that you need. Forget about your inabilities. Forget about everything that you think is disqualifying you because I've given you everything. All you have to do is get ready to move in faith. Understand this. When you move in faith, you're also going to attract criticism. Now, there are two types of criticism. I tell my premarital couples this. You got destructive and you have constructive. Two different types, but they feel the same. Destructive criticism is fashioned to do you harm. Constructive criticism is fashioned to do you good. 
We typically don't like them because we don't like the way that it feels. Understand this. When you are moving in the direction God wants you to move, there are people who are going to have comments. They're going to have opinions. And understand this, and I know some people are not going to like this, but if you're not ready for comments, controversy, and I'm not saying do things in a controversial manner just because, but when you're doing things in the way that God will want you to do things, if you're not ready for controversy, you're not ready for leadership. If you're not ready to be lied on and talked about, you're really not ready for God to move you and use you in the way that he could. Because the only way that you don't draw criticism, the only way that people's eyes don't go on you, the only way, I, I, it's, a, it's a minister who I know, uh, and he might be even watching right now, uh, Pastor Clyde Tate. I used to play for um, um, St. James for years, play for him for years. And he's he had actually a sermon. I remember a bunch of his sermons. But he had one sermon that said, picked out to be picked on. Understand this. There are times when you will be picked out. It seems like you've been picked out to be picked on. But there are cases when God actually wants to show somebody else the circle around how to respond when you are in leadership when God is using you in a way that he hasn't used somebody else when you're unafraid now of being talked about when you're unafraid now of being the subject of conversations because understand this you're going to be the subject of conversations you're going to be the subject of parking lot conversations you're going to be the subject of conversations that people are having on Facebook on Twitter conversations that people are having over text message conversations that people are having in rooms that you don't even know your name is coming up so understand this, just because you're getting attacked does not mean that you are not in the will of God. The Bible says you're actually blessed when you are persecuted for righteousness sake, not persecuted for the sake of being messy. Because when you're persecuted for the sake of being messy, you brought that, you brought that persecution yourself. But when you're persecuted for righteousness sake, Jesus says you are blessed. So in other words, when you're following God, you can expect Matthew chapter 5 to be light. You can also expect Matthew chapter 5 to be salt. So he's using you as light to show the right kind of example and as salt to change the flavor of whatever environment that you're in. Look here, the situations that God places you in, they are supposed to be better. Why? Because you're there. Those people on that ship, I am not even convinced that they would have even survived had Paul not been there. The reason why I say this is because Paul gave him the word to stay on the ship. God says you stay on the ship, then you are not going to be lost. Your, your, your life is not going to be lost. Come on back over here, Joseph. God took Joseph through all kinds of dysfunction, even at the hands of his own family, because essentially God took him from the pit to the palace, God took him to a place where essentially the same people who put him in the pit were the same ones who were depending on him. Not only them, but a whole nation, the whole region was depending on the wisdom that God gave Joseph when God took him from the pit to the palace. You know where you have been. You don't know where God may be taking you, but God many times takes you through detours. He takes you through negative situations. He takes you through things that you never thought that you deserve because God is building within you what you're going to need so that he will get the glory, not you. Uh-uh. It's not about your glory. It's about him getting the glory. And because of what God did in Joseph's life, people's lives were spared through that famine because of all of the dysfunction and the detours that God took Joseph through. Come on back over here, Paul. Through this detour, we also see that Paul was under attack now by a serpent. A serpent, an unthinkable kind of situation. Now, this is something else the Lord laid in my heart to share with you on tonight. Other people will take notice of how you handle attack. Let me say that one more time. Other people are going to take notice of how you handle attack. Let me let me let me dig on down into that. Because attack is not is is common to all of us and is not necessarily specific just to you. Everybody at one point or another goes through attack. 
But there are some people who cower down because they didn't like the way attack felt before. In fact, most of us don't like the way attack feels. But what we do is the longer that we stay with God and we get a few notches on our belt, we get a few scars on our face, we come to realize that the enemy is coming in like a flood. Isaiah 59, 19. I just know God is going to live up a standard against him. The Bible tells me in Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against me will prosper. I know the weapon is going to be formed against me. It's just not going to prosper. And that doesn't always mean that I won't be in a struggle. That doesn't always mean that I won't be in a fight. That doesn't always mean that I won't have some battle scars. You're going to have some battle scars one way or another. Some people are going to hurt your feelings. God is going to allow you to go through some hurtful situations. And it's not to destroy you, but it's to make you. It's because God sees what's on the inside of you. In fact, gold wouldn't be what gold would really be unless it goes through the process of purification. And purification means that it's going to take some heat to separate out the impurities and bring forth the pure gold that it actually is. You don't have a diamond unless you have cold, heat, uh, temperature, which is, yeah, cold, heat, and time and pressure, cold heat, time and pressure are what make a diamond. So you can't be what God wants you to be unless you get used to, number one, if you're cold, C-O-A-L, which just means you're a clump of carbon. God allows carbon under pressure, heat, and time to, de to develop into something that you couldn't even see it being. In fact, most of us would not buy coal, but a bunch of us have bought diamonds because people only want what you become. They don't want the process that it takes to make you into what you become. You know why you trust God the way that you trust God? Because there are certain situations in your life where you didn't had, to, you didn't had the option. You've had to trust him, either trust him or die. And because you've seen all of the little victories that God has given you, they amount to a huge one because the way that you've gotten to where you are right now is stepwise. One situation after another situation after another situation. One little victory after another little victory. Quit expecting God to give you big victories. Learn how to celebrate the small victories. Even when God is bringing you, it may be somebody out here right now who God has saved you just recently and God is bringing you into a place where you used to be addicted to something and now you're still struggling. You may still be fighting. Uh-huh, I'm talking to some people right now. I'm not talking to us. I'm not talking to the super saint right now. Those who just overcame everything and you never felt anything since you've been saved. I'm not talking to super saints. Super saints, I'll be right back at you in a little while. But I'm talking to somebody who has been through some things after God has delivered you out of something. You still found yourself struggling possibly from that or you found yourself struggling in other areas of your life. I'm here to tell you right now, God is not done with you. It's going to take some time. It's going to take you appreciating the little victories. It's going to take those little no's when you used to say yes and now you're saying no. Why are you saying no? Because the love of God is constraining me. And what do you mean, Pastor, when you say the love of God? That's what Paul says. The love of God constraineth me. So what is Paul telling us when he says the love of God constraineth? In other words, God is working from the inside out. When you get grown, people try to restrain. When you're young, people try to restrain. That's what handcuffs are for. But constraint is not external because you can restrain somebody and not change their will. And they not change on the inside. We have a correctional system right now. And we call it correctional system, but there are many people who are not rehabilitated when they get out of the system. Therefore, when they get out of the system and they get back into normal society because they have not changed from the inside, then we find that they go and do things that send them right back. There has not been correction. There has not been rehabilitation that has happened. And if I don't change the behavior, then I end up repeating the behavior. That's why God wants us to repent because repent and repeat are not the same thing. When I truly repent, then that means I don't go back to the same thing that God brought me out of. In other words, I have authentically changed. So in other words, I, you don't have to restrain me and keep me out of a club when God has delivered me and taken that away. If somebody out here who's listening to me right now, I already know I'm not going to finish this tonight, but if there's somebody out there who wants real true deliverance, God is able to do it if you want it for real. 
which also means now you're going to have to take yourself out of the environment. Don't willingly go back in the environment of what God delivered you out of. Because there are times when, when God brings you out, he wants you to stay out. You're not strong enough to go back in there and win everybody. You're overestimating your own abilities now. Now, does God do it quicker for some people than he does others? Absolutely. But understand this, you have to also exercise wisdom. If God just delivered you out of smoking, don't continue to find yourself around people who are actively smoking. Smoking. If God has delivered you from alcoholism, don't go back around people who are drinking. If God has delivered you out of pornography, stay off of those freaky dicky websites. If God has delivered you out of whatever, you stay away from the things that once bound you down. Because there may come a time when God will allow you to go and pull somebody out, but you have to understand that wisdom is what God gives you. The Bible tells me if any man lacks wisdom, James 1, let him ask of God who gives it liberally and upbraid it not. So in other words, when the love of God really constrains you, then that means God has gotten on the inside and he's changing me from the inside out. And when he changes me from the inside out, then I start to do differently. Why? Because if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In other words, God changes the way that I think. Come on over here, Romans chapter 12. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. So in other words, the love of God constrains me. Why don't I continue to do things that displease God? Because now I don't want to keep living in sin. Why don't I want to live in sin anymore? Because I know that it displeases the one who loves me. So does that mean that I'm going to draw some attack? Absolutely. The devil is not going to like me. Some of the people who you used to surround yourself around, they're going to call you acting funny now because you don't want to go and drink anymore. You don't want to go and smoke anymore. You don't want to go and lie anymore. You don't want to do things that, that uh, unsaved people are continuing to do. And some saved folks who should not be doing. I'm going to leave that where it is. I'm going to leave that right where it is. Because some of us saved folks have gone and started doing things that God is not pleased with. Do I continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Because if God delivered me out of it, how in the world can I keep on doing it? I ought to be dead to it. Amen, somebody. So in other words, what, what we're seeing now is people are going to take notice when you're under attack. So some people who used to be your friends... You're going to find that they are no longer your friends anymore. Why is that? Because you're making a different decision. So when God takes you on a detour and God shows you also who your friends are and who your friends are not, you're going to incur some attack. You're going to incur some vipers that were laying still at one point and they were waiting on the opportunity to come up and to bite you. But understand this, what God also wants us to see and he wants everybody around to see that you're not one who's just going to react but you're one who's going to respond reacting means you start cussing them back out reacting means you start fighting reacting means you run away reacting means you don't do those kinds of things responding means that i'm not going to curse those who curse me but i'm going to bless those who curse me the bible lets me know that i have to forgive those who have done things even against me the bible lets me know that god is expecting me to operate with new works and the right kind of works why not to be a christian but because i am a christian and I expect to be attacked. I expect to be talked about. I expect to be ridiculed. I expect for the unthinkable to happen. I expect people to draw conclusion. And this is something else God gave me. I need to slow down. I believe I'm talking too fast. I expect people to draw conclusions and make them known when I face situations. May I say that one more time? Expect people to draw conclusions. There are people who are going to draw conclusions and they don't even know the whole story. That's human nature. People are going to do that. And there are times within these detours that God takes you on where he actually shows you how people actually are. Detours many times seem like they are out of the way. 
But God can't use you to witness or to be a blessing in somebody else's life of how to overcome negativity, how to overcome negative comments, how to shake snakes back off, back into the fire. I'm going to say that again. How to shake some stuff off. Because some of us need to learn how to shake some mess off. Look here. You keep going around that same mountain over and over and over again because you had not learned how to shake some stuff off. Look, folks are going to be folks. You can't control how a person thinks. You can't control what a person may be thinking. Quit investing valuable time that you cannot get back trying to make people become what you think that you want them to be. Uh-uh. That's approval addiction. You're wasting time. Pump the brakes. You're wasting time. Expect people to draw conclusions. People are going to draw conclusions. People think that's the natural way. Look, you draw conclusions. People make assumptions and assessments of you when they first meet you. Some people figure out and they think that they know who you are without even coming to know, coming to get to know you. Look, when a person makes an assumption about you and when they make those kinds of conclusions, Quit driving yourself crazy and taking yourself out of the way trying to fashion yourself in a way that you think that they will be able to see you in the way that you really are. Just be who God wants you to be. If they are not blind, eventually they will see it. But guess what? There are some people, regardless to what hoops, what regardless to what, what ramps you jump over, regard, even if you gave them all of your money. Some people are still going to see you the way that they see you. Why? Because when a person makes up their mind, it's very difficult for you to change a decision that a person has made. I just want you and me. I'm not talking to just you. I'm talking to me too. I want all of us to get to the point where we expect people to draw conclusions. We expect people to make assumptions. That does not mean that I'm going to minimize what God wants to do in my life. But that means that God is going to grow me up in the middle of assumptions, in the middle of conclusions, in the middle of negative comments, in the middle of these detours. God is going to grow me up and teach me how to expect adversity anytime I'm moving in the direction that he wants me to move. I can't let that mess shake me. I have to learn how to shake it off. Now, I ain't fixing to dance. Number one, I can't dance. I ain't going to go down that road. But you got to learn how to shake some stuff off. Next time somebody comes with some negativity at you, I, you, do your own little shake. Whatever your little shake is. And don't even try to teach Pastor Wood how to dance. You, That's a lost cause. Number one, I'm saved. And the only dance I'll be doing is the dance for the Lord. So I ain't coming out there. You can forget that. <laughs> but anyway, learn how to shake that stuff off. Shake it off. There are some people who are trying to skew the way that other people even see you. They're trying to determine how other people see you. And guess what? There are people, if you allow a lie to run long enough, my mama used to say, a lie travels 90 miles an hour while the truth is just getting his shoes on. Understand this, a lie is fashion to run out there and do damage. And that's what a lie does. But understand this, the truth is still coming. And people will be able to see that a liar will always be exposed. I'm going to say that again. A liar will always be exposed. People will be able to see. Look here. When you are Christian, when you belong to the Lord, you don't have to worry about it. Everybody will be able to see it because Jesus says oh, in Matthew chapter five that a light can't be a light was not fashioned to be put under a bushel, but it's going to be beneficial to everybody. Those who are in the house and those who are all around, they will be able to see that light. Look at what the Bible tells us. And this is this is what Jesus was telling us in response to us dealing with conclusions and comments that people say. Look at what Jesus says over in Matthew chapter 12. Um, Matthew chapter 12 verse 34. Jesus says, for whatever is in your heart determines what you say. For out of the abundance of the heart, King James says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So in other words, whatever's in the heart is going to come out. I did this, uh, I did a message uh, a few weeks ago at Mary Grove Missionary Baptist Church, Heart Trouble. <laughs> and I need to I need to go back and preach that one again because the Lord gave me so much more even on that. But what's in a heart is going to come out. May I go even one farther? And I didn't break this one in into the uh, into the sermon uh, that night at, at Mary Grove. 
when you feel even that you have some heart issues, if there are some things that are causing you to go on a detour because God can't bring you into what he wants you to bring because it's, some still, it's still some junk in there that's stopping you from getting to where God wants you to get, ask God to purge you. Ask God to show you and ask God, even if it means making me uncomfortable, Lord, please help me to heal in those areas where my heart may be hurting. If you or I have passive aggressive behavior, in other words, you telling folks that you are right, but you're really not. It's, it's deceptive. It really is. You making it seem like you're cool. But you actually aren't. That's a sign of heart issue as well. Another sign of heart issue. Is if somebody else says something about the person. That you got something against. And you snicker and laugh. That's a sign of heart issue. If you're making smart remarks. Sly undertones. And you won't really own up. To what it is that you're saying. Or what it is that you're doing. Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So in other words, if your behavior is showing something that you don't like or that you know that God does not like, go back and check the heart. And God has a way also of sending you or me on a detour because he can't bring us into what he wants us to be. Because I'm still doing things that would mess up where he wants to take me. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this message on tonight. So, the Bible tells us, just to show you how people make conclusions. I hope this is a blessing to somebody on tonight. Just to show you how people make conclusions. Over in John chapter 9. There was a guy who had basically been born blind. He had been born from... He had been born blind. In other words, he was never able to see. Now, during Jesus' time, it was common for people to think that if a person was born blind or born with some kind of disability, that sin must have been the reason. So, people tried to attach sin to a condition. And people do that even now. They figure that if you're going through something that if you have had some, some, some calamity or something that has happened in your life, they figure that it's something that you did to cause what it is that you're in. So they ask the question in John chapter 9, who sinned? Did his mama, did his daddy, did his parents sin? Is that the reason why he was born blind? Again, they're trying to draw conclusions. He's blind, so I need to make sense out of what he's blind. Now understand this, there are people in your life trying to make sense out of what it is that you're going through when it actually is not their business. But they're trying to make sense of the stuff that you're in because for some reason, if they can make sense of it, some people will try to avoid it and other people are going to use it as a measure to say, mm -hmm, see there, I told you, I told you. I, like they all of this and all of that. I mean, that's the way that people are because some people just get off we're trying to make you feel bad while making them feel good about themselves. Jesus says in John chapter 9, it's not that his parents sinned, but the reason why this particular thing happened was so that the power of God can be seen in him. There are situations that you're in. Sometimes the negatives that you're in, it's not really about you. It's about what God wants to do in you. It's about what God wants to do through you. It's about what God wants to be seen within your life. You're going to show people who don't trust him like you do. You're going to show them what it means to really go to war against the devil even through tears. What it means to keep on praying even when you don't see the manifestation. Even when it seems like you're getting attacked even by your family folks. Even by people who you were cool with. Come on back over here Job. Job had gone through calamity on in, in an epic way, an epic scale. He had gone through so much calamity to where the theology of his friends come out. When they finally open up their mouth, then dumb stuff comes out. They're figuring 
It must have been something. Job, certainly you must have seen the reason why you're going through all of this. That's people's mindset. Don't try to get in somebody else's mind trying to get them to think the way that you want them to think. You can explain yourself into an early grave. Just be what God wants you to be. If God tells you to say something, then say it. Otherwise, there are certain situations and certain conversations you don't even have to address everything. Just let God work it out. Because the more that my mouth stays out of control, the more detours God sometimes takes me on. Why? Because I'm not mature enough. Lord Jesus. I'm not mature enough to expect to be attacked when I go through things. When you go through things, not only will the devil attack you, but sometimes people will attack you. And sometimes I brought it on myself. And other times God just allows me to go through it. However, I may find myself still under attack. And Jesus says, in the example of that man who was born blind, Jesus says it was not that that man sinned. It was not that he brought it on himself. He was a victim of circumstances. He was born blind, but God is going to get the glory out of this. In other words, when God, when Jesus got through doing what he did, Jesus got the glory. God got the glory out of that dysfunction. So the Bible tells me as we're going to bring it to a close on tonight, Lord, y'all got to come back on next Tuesday night. We're not going to do this one on Sunday. We're going to bring this one back on Tuesday night. It's so much more meat in there. I can't hardly wait to get to it. However, over in Acts chapter, look here, the word of God ought to be so exciting to us. It really should be so exciting. So Acts chapter 28, verse 4, the Bible says, the people of the island saw it hanging. Hold up. There are people who see your attack. And they see how the devil is still hanging on you. Now, I'm not saying that snake is the devil. I'm just drawing an analogy here. People see even how other people have fashioned things to try to take you out. There are people who heard the lie. They saw the lie when it was being told. They already saw how the person was setting a trap for you. They already saw the things that you were going through. And they were trying to figure, is that person even going to come out of this? Look here. Look at what the look at what the conclusion was that those people on Malta thought. The people on the island saw it hanging from his hand. So in other words, it was not something that somebody told somebody. They literally saw it. They saw the snake hanging from the man's hand. The snake had gotten into um, the poisonous snake, a venomous snake. I don't know if it was copperhead. I don't know if it was a water moccasin. I don't know if it was a rattlesnake. I don't know what kind of snakes they had on Malta. I don't intend to go to Malta. <laughs> but anyway... Whatever that, did. and they said they eradicated them, but I don't think I'll find out. But anyway, the snake had not only lashed on the, onto his hand, but the snake literally bit him. They saw that snake hanging from that man's hand. The Bible says this is what the people thought. A murderer, no doubt. Look at that conclusion right off. People already tag you. When you go through something, the first thing they do is call you by what they think. They call you by what they see. They even talked about Jesus. They call him a wine bibber and a publican. They called him all kinds of names. Get used to name calling. Look, if you're not used to name calling, just get ready for it. If you can't handle name calling, you can't handle being brought up in God where you need to be. But guess what? Because they call us sanctified folk, they call us holy rollers. I'm glad to be a holy roller. I'm glad to be. Yeah, the Ark of Safety is a sanctified church. In fact, every church ought to be sanctified. If you're not sanctified, you're not a church. That means you're not set aside for the work of Christ. Guess what? Yeah, we're tongue talkers, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, and glad about it. Because when the rapture gets ready to take place, guess what? It's not about me, but it's about what my God and I have his stuff living on the inside of me. And I intend when he says, come up here to be absent from this body, be present with the Lord, to be caught up out of here. And I'm ready to get up out of here. I'm going to leave Corona behind, whatever her name is. I'm going to leave COVID-19 behind. I'm going to leave the flu behind. I'm going to leave colds behind. I'm going to leave all ca cancer behind, heart disease. Look at you ought to be ready to see Jesus. Lord, I'm about to start preaching. Let me leave that where it is. But that's what people said. People said instantly that he is a murderer, no doubt. So if he's a murderer, what are they expecting? They're expecting a murderer to die. The Bible says here, though he escaped the sea. Now, everybody knew that he just came out of a situation that probably should have killed him. So now they see him going through something else. I have a question. Have people ever seen you come out of one thing and now they see you in something else and they just figure right now, oh, yeah, you it must be you. 
It's not always you. Sometimes it may be. If God is trying to straighten you up, he may bring you on a detour. But sometimes it might not necessarily be you. You could be serving just like Paul was doing. Paul was up there trying to make sure enough wood was on the fire so that everybody he benefited. He was doing a good thing. But went through something negative. You can be doing something good. And your good be mistaken. Your good be negatively talked about. Your good have people saying, well, he's just trying to get some glory out of this. He doing it for his own benefit. He's doing it for... That couldn't. That might not have even been what your intent was. Look here. Whenever you want to do something for somebody, just do it. Now, Jesus taught us how to do it over in Matthew chapter 6. So he says, you don't, you don't let one hand know what the other hand is doing. In other words, he says, when you're going to give alms, don't ever do anything for the purpose of being glorified yourself. Only do things for the purpose of giving God the glory so that God gets the glory out of what you're doing. So in other words, when these people see him, what they figure is they said that he escaped the sea, but justice will not permit him to live. Now, as we get ready to bring this to a close, y'all see I'm closing for the second time. We are getting ready to close. Anybody know what that picture is? That picture that you're looking at right there. We call her blind justice, lady justice. So when we look at justice, Justice actually, or probably, should be looked up on more, in a more proper way as opposed to a common noun like it is. Um, some translations call it vengeance as well. So, the word justice, justice will deal with him, or justice is dealing with him. Justice is giving him really what he deserves. It literally comes from the Greek word, DK, DK. It looks like dyke, but it's not dyke. It's DK. DK is the goddess. DK is actually, in Greek mythology, the daughter of Zeus, one of the daughters of Zeus. And DK gets a lot of her qualities also from her mom. So DK here, and those who believe in astrology and that kind of stuff, you're looking at your astrological signs. That's a whole other Bible study. Uh, saints should not be caught up in astrology. But anyway, you may see also those who consider themselves to be Libra with the scales. This is also tied in. So DK here is the goddess of justice, vengeance, execution, punishment, and judgment. So DK also is moral order or fair judgment. Now understand this. These were polytheistic people. These were heathen people on Malta. Even a lot of the people who were traveling with Paul at this time. These are heathen people. So they believed in the Greek gods and goddesses. So they're not saying that he's getting what he deserves just because of the common noun justice but if you dig a little bit deeper even if you were to go back and really do a word search you will see vengeance or justice here is actually traced back to their belief in DK or the goddess of justice the goddess of vengeance the goddess of execution the goddess of punishment the goddess of judgment some people will call uh, this kind of situation also karma or the universe bringing you back what you actually deserve. So people are saying that Paul was a murderer. People are saying that Paul did all of this kind of stuff and now he's just getting back what he deserved. So when they see him going through this kind of situation, that's what their assumption is. That this goddess of judgment is now getting him. She's blind justice. And that's kind of where ours comes from. Well, the United States. I'm not going to say ours because I don't believe in uh, Greek mythology and some of that stuff that we've assimilated in. I don't know. I don't agree with all of it. But anyway, blind justice, that's kind of where that actually comes from. And it does have Latin roots as well. But they figure that this goddess is the reason why this goddess is going to make him die. 
But the Bible tells me something so interesting. In Acts 28, 5. But Paul shook off the snake. Remember what I told you a little bit earlier when I was about to get wound up. Paul shook off the snake. Didn't mean the snake didn't bite him. But Paul shook off the snake into the fire, the Bible says, and was unharmed. In other words, Paul was so, and you know what, Paul was so cool with this. I wonder if Paul just did like that. Thing got right there in the, in the fire. Paul didn't freak out. That's why I don't want you to freak out when God shows you who the snakes are in your life. Paul didn't get all disturbed. I don't want you to get disturbed when people start talking about you, when people throw your name in front of the bus. Don't get disturbed. Part of you might, but understand this, expect it, because the only way that you don't draw criticism is that you are doing nothing. And then there are those who say, well, he ain't doing anything, so therefore nobody's talking about him or anything like that. Paul shook this thing off, and he was unharmed. Now, I don't understand how that happened other than it was miraculous how God did that thing. Saints and friends learn how to shake that stuff off. When the enemy comes in, when the devil comes in, I want you to get to the point, yeah, devil, I've seen you act like this before. I've seen you stir up stuff before. But guess what? You got your behind whooped last time. You're going to get your behind whooped this time. I'm going to hold my peace and let God order my steps. I'm going to hold my peace and let God fight my battle. And when God tells you to open up your mouth and say something, you say what the Lord says and get about your feelings. Because understand this, God is able to fight your battle a whole lot better than you can. When they saw it, that's exactly what happened. Let me tell you something. When you are in the will of God, I want you to free yourself from the pressure of vindication. You don't have to feel like you have to you have to clear your good name because guess what? When you get down there in the dirt with people, you're going to really make your name muddy and then you're going to add more validation to what some people are already saying and thinking anyway. Some people are saying that you know you ain't you know ain't nothing to a Christian. A Christian going to act a fool just like anybody else. That's what people are expecting. But you throw them up off their game when you allow God to order your steps. When you allow God to do what God is going to do. Look what the Bible tells us. In Acts 28, 6 through 7, the people waited for him to swell up. There are people who are waiting on the devices that they've sent there against you. They're waiting on a bad thing to happen when you're in the will of God. They're waiting on some kind of effect to happen because they figure their conclusion is that you're going to get what you got coming. Guess what? If you're in the will of God, you got something coming. You got a big fat blessing coming your way. It may come through a whole slew of devils, but he got, look, God got something for you. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men. The thing that God is prepared to them that love him. If you're in sin, you better come up out of sin because on hell, in hell you're going to lift up your eyes. But look here, and you don't follow God for the blessing but that's just what God gives you when you're in relationship with him. The Bible says the people waited for him to swell up or to suddenly drop dead. But when they had waited, look at what the Bible says a long time. There are some folks who might go to their grave Waiting on you to get what they think you got coming. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus, I thank you. But when they had waited a long time and saw that he wasn't harmed, look what the Bible says. They changed their minds and decided that he was a God. Lord, now they're trying to make the man into a God. Their minds changed. That's why I was telling you a little bit earlier. Don't put much weight in what people's assessments and what people's conclusions actually are. People are still trying to take in data. Some people who don't even know you, they're still taking in data. They don't know what to think about you. Show them the right kind of example. Show them who you really do serve. Show them that God's got your back through whatever. Because when you show them that God is, is lifting you up in the middle of all of the trouble that you're in, you're then showing them how a Christian, how a follower of God, somebody who's bought by the blood of Jesus, how they respond and not react when trouble comes. You can expect for trouble to come. But I'm so glad that I serve a God. The Bible tells me in Psalm 46, 1, he is my refuge and he is a very present help in trouble. Not from trouble, but in trouble. Jesus.